Hey everyone, welcome to another great interview on The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. This time around, I talked to author Owen Symes about his book, He Was Our Man in Washington, A History of the Obama Years. It was a great chat, and I'm going to tell you that you should go out and buy his book. It's available at Zero Books, and I will make sure to put a link in the show notes. Uh, This is another interview that I would have liked to have done weeks ago, uh, but when I mainly put out one every two weeks... It take, makes it tough to keep up. Uh, on the plus side, I have great content for weeks and weeks pretty easily as long as I can keep up with the production. What helps me with my production schedule is if I don't have to work on my days off. For this show and my other projects, uh, to stay on at least some kind of schedule, I need to make money uh, to help pay the bills. And if you want to help out with that, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. And if you can't help out financially, then a five-star rating and a review on the podcast app of your choice or on Podchaser would be great. <sighs> okay, now that I've got the begging out of the way, <laughs> um, I have a little bit of housekeeping to do. Uh, my latest episode, when I talked to Jason Shevtel on uh, a China, got some feedback from someone whose opinion I value and who I think is a thoughtful person. So I thought it was worth bringing up. Uh, Janus, who is a friend of mine on Discord and is in the Mind of a Skeptical Leftist Discord channel or Discord server, if you want to join, there is a uh, link in the show notes. They sent me a a message. uh, Hey, dude, no offense to you, my friend. I think your podcast is great. But at about 44 minutes in the newest episode, China, I had to shut it off. I couldn't take your guest's chauvinism or mocking tone any longer. He seems like a smart guy, but he strikes me as a typical expat who thinks he gets it, but falls into some of the same tropes I've heard from a lot of liberals slash right-wingers about China. Specifically, his reductionist hand-waving of ideology of the state. I'm no expert either, but I literally had a conversation last night on this topic from someone from China. I am certain they would get angry just at listening to this as it borders on xenophobia. Anyway, that's just my opinion. Nothing against you. Keep doing what you're doing. And I think this is a fair criticism. At times during the editing process, I felt a little uncomfortable with the way Jason framed some things. Uh, But I still put out the episode with minor editing because I didn't want to be dishonest on the production end. And my knowledge of China isn't firm enough to disagree with much of what he said. However, he is not the only voice. Uh, speaking on the subject of China or the actions of the Chinese state. Uh, You all know me well enough to know I'm not interested in defending a state uh, when that state behaves in authoritarian ways, but I also want to be accurate when I talk about things. Uh, So while I did feel uncomfortable with some of what Jason said or the way that he framed it, I can't disagree with much of it without more information. And I think I might have mentioned in the interview itself how hard I have found it to uh, get what I consider accurate uh, information on China. Everybody seems to have a bias going in. There's virtually no way to access information from China or about China without somebody having a slant on it. So (laughs) I am very open to hearing more on the subject of China though, and I would be quite willing to have another guest on to discuss it. Though Again, I I am very wary of someone who is overly critical, and I'm very wary of someone who is overly supportive uh, of the state of China. That brings me to something that I've also been thinking a little bit about, and that's nuance. I I can't speak for all anarchists, obviously, but for most of the ones that I know, uh, they approach various subjects with uh, with nuance. Uh, We're uh, never going to say that a state is good, (laughs) because they're not. Uh, Or... (laughs) All states limit freedom in the name of withholding power in the hands of a few rather than the many. Uh, They all claim that they're doing good while what they're doing is actually doing good for the few instead of the many. So in essence, they're all bad. But we can see when one state is doing better or worse than another (laughs) in one area or another without being apologetic for the things that those states do badly. So to clarify, I can be 
in favor of some things that Soviet Russia did while still acknowledging the problematic aspects of that. And I think that this is a strength compared to some on the left who will go out of their way to make apologies for or excuse or outright deny the harms that various states do if those states align with their ideology. Uh, I, I think this is the strongest case for anarchism to say that we do not make excuses for bad actions carried out by ostensibly leftist states while being able, while we're still able to maintain that anti-imperialist mindset. For like, and as an example, China is not the utopia that some leftists want you to believe. They do commit crimes against human rights. But no, I don't believe that the U.S. should interfere or invade in any sense. But what this really means is that I am not in favor of any of the states. I am always in favor of solidarity with those struggling against the state, so long as those struggling are not also participating in the oppression of others. Anarchism is, I think, a pragmatic set of ideas, but without compromise on the values that those ideas stem from. And with that, I'm going to send you to my conversation with Owen Symes on his book, He Was Our Man in Washington, A History of the Obama Years. All right. Hi, and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm talking to Owen Symes. That's right. You got it. You guessed right. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, author of uh, a book about Ob- the Obama presidency. Yep. He was uh, our man in Washington, a history of the Obama years. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, I guess a good place to start is like just a little bit of your background uh, and uh, yeah, maybe just start there. Sure. So I um, graduated from Hillsdale College with a BA in history. Um, if people are not familiar with Hillsdale, it's one of those places, if you know it, you really know it. And if you don't know it, you're like, what the hell is this? It's a small <laughs> liberal arts college in rural Michigan, uh, very well known in conservative circles. It's kind of become this, over the last 20 years, become this bastion of um you know, what they look at is like defending liberty and pursuing truth. And, okay. Uh, and they have like free classes on the constitution online and that there's a lot of uh, hero worship of the the founding fathers and things like that. So um, I, I originally came from a relatively conservative uh, milieu, right? Like okay. my dad and I uh, saw Hillsdale College referenced in National Review, which is still, I think, one of the largest uh, right-wing magazines out there, if there are magazines still being published. Um, <laughs> right. And, you know, the whole idea was that, you know, this was a place where you could get a real education and, and that kind of thing. And as it turned out, even though the administration was very politically conservative, the professors there kind of did a pretty good job. Uh, okay. they, like I actually read some Karl Marx and Michel Foucault and uh, nice. a lot of um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was kind of a progenitor with a lot of those guys. Um, and so I came out of there, not exactly like a liberal or even a leftist, but just kind of like politically agnostic. Um, okay. after, after four years, I was like, I don't think this administration is right. I don't think the conservatives are right, but I don't really care anymore. I'm going to do my own thing. Sure. Uh, fast forward to 2016, I had been working as a, a psychiatric technician or a call center supervisor, all these various kinds of things. Because like, what do you do with a history degree? Not a whole lot, unless you want to go unless- to law school, <laughs> right? Or yeah. um, you know, maybe be like a political lobbyist or something like that. Um, and I didn't really do any of that stuff. So um, I was just kind of floating around and then Trump won the election and I was, I think like a lot of people pretty stunned about that. Yeah. Um, I didn't like Hillary Clinton. I was pretty intrigued by Bernie Sanders, but I still voted for Clinton because I was like, well, it's very, usually it's, you know, the lesser of two evils, but Trump seems like a lot worse, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, now a lot of that ended up being optics. His policies actually like right. in a lot of ways were the same, whatever. But, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, he definitely came across as a lot worse. So after we got a reality TV star as president, um, I started trying to take a look at the previous administration because I had been pretty aloof from politics. I didn't really remember a lot about Obama. I remember in uh, 2008, I voted for McCain and I thought Obama was a socialist. But then in 2012, I didn't even vote because I didn't give a crap, right? Okay. So I start researching. I go down the rabbit hole of the war on terror, the you know the Great Recession, and I start kind of reading through uh, deeper American history. 
uh, more about indigenous genocide and the history of slavery and how that, okay. um, you know, influenced American economic expansion. And within like a year of doing that research, I was like, am I a socialist now? Like, <laughs> what the heck just happened to my life? Right? Um, so it just so happened that I, I came at it um, originally pretty positive of Obama, just in comparison to Trump. You know, you read some cursory stuff like, oh, Obama doesn't seem like a bad president. Seems like a pretty decent guy, uh, some decent policies. And then you really get into the weeds of it and you realize like, okay, obviously with compared to Trump, he's leagues better at right. least in some ways, but uh, um, <laughs> within the context of the larger American project, there's a lot of problems to deal with, not just with him, but with the institution of the presidency and, yep. and, and everything else. Um, and so I submitted the rough draft to Zero Books and they said, yep, get us the finished product and they went ahead and published it. And you know, here we are, you know, basically three years, three plus years after I started doing the research and I have a book on my hands. Right, right. When you write a book, what, like, how much research did you have to do? Uh, this is fairly contemporary stuff. Uh, was it mostly news sources, or was there like a deeper form of research that you had to do? So I used a lot of news sources, a lot of contemporary reporting, which you know has its own, um, you know, problems with bias yeah. and with the do they lack their sources? Are they actually quoting uh, directly, or is it background that kind of thing? Um, a lot of memoirs, because obviously these people want to get their side of the story out. Right. Um, and that doesn't always tell you what actually happened, but it does at least tell you what they want you to think happened, how they <laughs> want their side of the story presented, what their right. bias is. Um, a lot of federal reports and government reports, okay. um, things like that. The, the federal government uh, has a lot of stuff that they publish. So all the public utterances of the president, they publish in volumes. Um, these gigantic tomes, uh, even PDFs, they're huge PDFs. Right. Um, so it'll have all of Obama's speeches, all his, you know, Q and A's at a high school or, you know, that kind of thing and interviews and things like that. Um, which that's a, a huge compendium of information. So, um, because this is contemporary history and because I don't have like special access to like these people, I'm not, I'm not like a well-known historian or, um, you know, like a, a Bob Woodward kind of investigative journalist. There's not right. like bombshell archival stuff in this book, but what I really tried to do was based on all this publicly available information uh, that anyone could find if they put their mind to it, like what can we come away from as far as the Obama legacy as far as how he's situated uh, against other presidents uh, and within the larger purview of American history. Um, Cause that's kind of where I, I came at it after a while. Cause there was so much stuff that I didn't know, even with a BA in history. Uh, when I was in college, I concentrated more on like medieval ancient history, but oh, okay. I still had to take a bunch of American history courses. I took a history course on the founding of the American Republic or, uh, you know, post civil war uh, to world war two history like that era. Oh, okay. Um, um, and I don't remember learning almost anything about, you know, indigenous people or the, right. the, the experience of the recently enslaved or, um, you know, reconstruction and all its gory details. Right. So I, I included a lot of stuff in the book about that. Every chapter it, it's um, organized topically. So there's, you know, war on terror, great recession, um, kind of marginal struggles. So African-Americans, gay liberation and, and trans issues. Um, and then uh, the, climate change, uh, healthcare, and then it ends with a short chapter on like the pipeline battles to focus on indigenous people. Right. Um, and so within each of those chapters, there's a, a long introductory section, just kind of bringing the reader up to speed. Like what exactly happened to get us to the point where Obamacare was what people thought was realistic <laughs> or, uh, you know, that what got us to the point where Obama thought that drone strikes were a good idea on a large scale. Um, Cause I, my impression, at least from my own experience and from my limited observations is that people have such a shallow view of American history. Like we barely remember the Clinton years, right. right or even, right. or even Bush, people are rehabilitating his image in comparison to Trump, which is terrifying. Cause if you look at the Bush presidency, it's so much worse than Trump in so many ways, <laughs> um, just yeah. a complete dumpster fire. Um, but that's easy to forget. And so let alone talking about LBJ or FDR or, uh, you know, Indian removal or any of that stuff. Right. Yeah. So I tried to include um, as much of that context as I thought I could get away with to give, uh, you know, the, the intelligent but not very well informed reader uh, a 
broader sense of where Obama fit into the American narrative. That's interesting. Like, I guess in a sense, I I have also could say that before the last few years, I was relatively ignorant about American history or even Canadian history, right? Like I'm from Canada. Um, uh, and it's almost like, uh, I don't want to say that they teach us this way on purpose, but it seems like they just omit certain things because <laughs> it doesn't fit the, the, our country is great kind of narrative. Yeah. And I remember in high school, I had a, a really well-meaning uh, Vietnam vet uh, liberal teacher. And at the time I was kind of knee-jerk conservative because all the, I was in like the the AP history classes. That was, the, I, I didn't like school at all, but I did take the AP history stuff because I liked history. Um, and most of the people around me were more liberal, um, not really progressive, but like solid Democrat. And so I didn't like a lot of them really. So, or a lot of anybody, I was a really angry <laughs> teenager. Um, but so I was kind of knee jerk, like, okay, well, if they're liberal, I'm going to be more conservative. Right. Right. So there was a lot of anti-Iraq war stuff and everything else. And so I did like a PowerPoint junior year in American history, uh, in support of the Iraq war. Um, <laughs> you know, I wish I could find it because I, I'm so interested in what my arguments were at the right, time. Right, right? Yeah. Um, and my, my teacher wasn't convinced, but he did say, you know, like, you've probably come as close as anyone to, to actually convincing me. I'm still not, but, um, but anyway, so even he, um, you know, doing the best he could with, I want to say the textbook was like the American pageant. Um, okay. And it's like a little more like milk toast liberal. It does delve into like some of the problems in the, in American history, but it doesn't really center them as like a core part of the experience. And I think that's okay. kind of, that's kind of the best, at least American public education can do is when they do talk about those things, they talk about them as mistakes right. um, or uh, accidents, as opposed to this was the core project. Right, um, right. And I think when you change that emphasis, um, it really changes how you view the history. And I'm sure it's the same with Canada, right? Like, yeah. you can say the residential schools that have been in the news are bad, but they're not just bad. They're kind of part and parcel of the Canadian the core, project. Yeah, that's right. right. It was part of how Canada was built. Like, yep. yeah. yeah. And so when you when you change that emphasis, I think it gives you a much different appreciation for how these uh, historical currents are still roiling today. Yeah. Um, so at least that was, that was true for me. So, so without giving away too much of the book, where does Obama fall on the scale of least worst to most <laughs> absolute like Trump style, uh, presidents? Well, or George Bush, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So if you, if you look at things from a, a relatively conventional, um, maybe like soft liberal perspective, like he ranks pretty good. Um, he saved the economy, uh, continuing policies that had been kind of foisted onto Bush, but he did, you know, bail out the banks and all that kind of stuff, which if you right. view the banks as legitimate institutions, that's probably a good thing. Right. You know, bailing out the auto industry, um, continuing to fight the war on terror, but without as much of the um, excesses and adventurousness and zealotry of the Bush years, there wasn't another mm -hmm. invasion of Iraq. Right. He tried to be a little bit more um, what he thought of as surgical in that way, right. um, you know, giving Americans more access to health care, um, you know, backing down one pipeline, even if he didn't really back down on the other pipeline. So there's there's a um, from some perspectives, an admirable degree of compromise and at least some degree of progressive reform. He did eventually stop defending the Defense of Marriage Act and supported um, marriage equality um, and right. was thankful about the, the SCOTUS decision, um, helped repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, um, that kind of thing. So from a, a more liberal perspective, he does pretty well. You can chalk up a lot of his failures to Republican recalcitrance, which is, uh, had been building since Clinton, um, but was made that much more adamantine by the racist element of the Republican Party. Um, so you can chalk some of that up to uh, some of Obama's failures up to that. Um, now, having said that, he is thoroughly neoliberal in his outlook. Right. So, yeah. so there is an assumption that the market is the ideal mechanism of solving problems. Mm. If you can have a market do it, you should. Um, an emphasis on public-private partnerships. So instead of trying to fix the economy directly, the government will partner with the banks and give them all the money so that the banks can fix the economy that they broke. Um, <laughs> so it's yep. one of those things. If you if you disagree with that neoliberal ideology, his reforms seem at best misguided and at worst, uh, you know, disastrous. 
right. right? Because you stabilize the economy and you eventually get credit flowing again, although it took a long time and the banks used a lot of that money to line their own pockets. But eventually credit did start to flow again and that's good, I guess. Um, but at the same time, those banks were allowed, because they survived, they gobbled up the banks that weren't allowed to survive, and you have increased concentration of wealth in these larger and larger institutions. So it's one of those things like it's a short-term stopgap, but it kind of makes the existing problems worse so that the next time there's a crash, it's going to be even more disastrous probably because these systemically important institutions, these too big to fail things are even more bloated now. Um, so a lot of his solutions uh, ended up just kind of delaying what seems to be like an inevitable escalation of these crises. Um, so outside that neoliberal framework, he does pretty poorly. But then again, right. pretty much all U.S. presidents do. Right. Um, so if you if you're ranking U.S. presidents and they're all basically at the bottom of the heap, Obama's <laughs> like top third of that bottom. Okay. You well, know, I mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say because he didn't he didn't get us into any disasters like Iraq. That's important. Yeah. Um, Libya was a disaster, but we kind of stayed out of it once it fell apart. Um, mm -hmm. So it was really bad for the people there. Um, but like with many American foreign policy mistakes, as long as it doesn't directly affect our people, we chalk that up as a success. Right. <laughs> um and, you know, the the Iran deal was obviously a pretty good thing, all things considered within the context of um, how bad our relationship with Iran has been right. the past 40 years. So even the fact that we negotiated anything is pretty, pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, on the whole, like if you're looking at it more conventionally, definitely top fourth, I would say, um, top 25%. If you're looking at it from a, a leftist perspective, he's got the same problems as the rest of them do. He just talks a lot nicer about it um, at the end of the day. Yeah, wow. something uh, like uh, my partner uh, often says, like she it tends to be in support of anyone who is uh, an enemy of America. <laughs> and, and I kind of I, I understand where she's coming from, because uh, the American government's foreign policy is pretty much horrendous all the way around. Um, <clears throat> but I always preferred the Democrats, at least insofar as their social uh, policy, like they weren't like social conservatives, really. So I always thought that was at least good. <laughs> yeah, it's tough because, um, you know, the Democrats will often uh, dangle this carrot of a little bit of social progress as they beat you with the stick of the same economic policies there as the Republicans. So right. it's yeah, it's um, it's a, a electoralism in the U.S. right now is very much a, a trap in that way because you don't really get any long term improvements. You just get yeah. one party is insane and the other party is conservative. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, right. it's very frustrating. I, yeah. I know Canadian politics are a lot better, but at least you guys have the, what is it? The NDP, um, which is yeah. a little bit better. There's like, yeah. they're like all Bernie Sanders Democrats, essentially. Like, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> which is, that's better which is why have. they don't have any, uh, this is, they'll never actually hold power federally. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. So, yeah. It's, uh, it's nice to have them at least. So you have an option you can vote for if you're still into voting, but. Yeah, I, I wonder. I don't know. It's one of those things. Like, is it a pipe dream that's useful or a pipe dream that's not? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to gauge. Like, it seems like. Uh, I, I mean, I, this is kind of a, a far afield from the book itself, but it seems like there is no uh, no solution to our problems that is based in electoral uh, elections or any kind of party politics. Yeah, I, and that's kind of like a that simmers under the surface of the book is just kind of this. Uh, hopefully, it nudges readers to kind of ask the question like, if because Obama in a lot of ways was kind of the best the best a neoliberal could hope for. Mm. He was in, extremely intelligent. He he understood a lot of the mistakes of the Bush years. He had a popular mandate when he was elected. He had uh, you know uh, majorities in both houses of Congress, and this was the result. So if this is as good as the best of the neoliberal bunch can get, and this is what American electoral politics can give us, what does that say about the limitations of that institution Right. and maybe what we should be doing instead? So it doesn't directly answer those questions because it's a history book um, right. and I'm not uh, daring enough to answer those questions in print. <laughs> um, it's much easier to criticize than to produce solutions, right? Fair, fair. Um, 
but I, and that's kind of the the goal of the book is a lot of these conclusions are not um, surprising from a leftist perspective, but um, I wanted to try and present a, a well reasoned and well researched argument that at the very least leftists can show their normie right. peers. Yeah, right. It's a book that's very accessible in that way, um, and you can read it. Uh, piecemeal if you want, because again, it's organized topically. So you, you just want to read about the war on terror. I'm just going to read that chapter. I'm just going to read about right. healthcare. I don't know why you want to read about healthcare, but if you wanted to, you could. Um, <laughs> that the, kind of thing. For the wonky nerd type. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the cool thing I think about the structure of the book is if you read it cover to cover, I tried to make it more radical as it went along. Okay. So it starts out with the war on terror, which to my mind was pretty much the most universally dismissed part of the Bush years. Pretty much everyone agreed that even if the war on terror had to be fought, it was fought very poorly. Right. Right. So I tried to come at it from the perspective of, okay, here are the mistakes Bush made. Here's what Obama did to try and ameliorate those and fix those mistakes. Here's why that didn't really work. And what does that really say about this as um, a foreign policy objective? Maybe this mm. is something that isn't actually achievable. You can't actually fight against a tactic as an objective. That's right. dumb. Um, so it kind of picks that apart just as yeah. a specific example of American foreign policy. Then it gets into the economy, which I think maybe not as many, but many, many people, even Republicans, think that the economy was mishandled in 2007, 2008. Um, I think only about a third of Republicans actually voted for the TARP funds or something like that. So there was a lot of division at the time um, about whether that was even a good idea. Right. Um, so I thought that might be a, another very accessible early chapter to include because a lot of people on the right and the left both think that the rich people are bad. It's just a matter of, do you think you should become a member of the rich or do you think that there shouldn't be any rich? Right? Yeah. Um, and then from there, like healthcare is the middle chapter because I think a lot of people are dissatisfied with healthcare. Um, and then from there, it, it, it veers off into like the marginal struggles, which I think liberals and conservatives, both, especially if they're white might not really have a good understanding of, um, and then climate change, which is obviously very controversial on the right. Um, and then finally, uh, the indigenous pipeline struggles, which I wanted to make sure to include that because there's a lot of stuff in the book that I didn't have space to include, like Obama's uh, immigration policies, right. his policies with China. I think I only briefly mentioned Iran because I wanted to focus specifically on the war on terror because right. um, I didn't want to make this like an unapproachable you know, uh, doorstopper of a book. Right. Um, but I did want to include something about it, uh, how Obama handled indigenous people because it's so often left out of our history books. Um, and this people are always surprised, like this stuff is still happening. What? There are still American Indians around? Like, yeah, there <laughs> yeah. are. I'm sorry we didn't kill them all, apparently. Like, what, did you, that's what you know, I, I think um it might have been I don't know if it was Nick Estes or someone else I was listening to where they said that they literally were talking to a, a white student at one point and they were just the, the student was kind of floored, like I thought we killed all of you. Not like in a bad way, like I thought we killed all of you, but just like I legitimately thought the genocide was just sadly effective, tragically effective, you know? Right. Um, and it turns out like, no, there's a lot of them still floating around and they're still doing things and they're still resisting empire. And so yep. I thought to close the book with um, at least a, a taste of that to try and maybe push the reader a little bit towards asking like, is the American project even legitimate as a thing? Mm -hmm. Um, so you start off with maybe this one foreign policy thing's a bad idea, and then hopefully you end with maybe America, at least as it's currently organized, is a bad idea. Yeah, um, yeah. So no, that's fair. No, that sounds like. A, so I guess would this be something I could give to my conservative father, and he would uh, understand some of the critiques? I think so. I think definitely. Um, I'm upfront in the introduction that it is from a socialist perspective, so maybe he'll put it down after 10 pages. <laughs> right. But but I think if he gives it a fair shot, um, like there's there's some you know irony, there's some sarcasm, but for the most part, I try and err on the side of um, just being, if not objective, then at least like I, but the rhetoric is kind of cool. Um, it's it's kind of contained at least for a while and. <laughs> As the book gets more comfortable with itself and as it kind of lets the reader in on more of this leftist ideology, I think the rhetoric becomes a little bit more outspoken. Um, and, you know, maybe that's a strength or not. Um, but hopefully the reader can get an appreciation for at least where the left half of the spectrum is coming from, even if they end up disagreeing. Yeah, it seems like because obviously in, in Canada, we 
don't have that many uh, people who are worried about or who were worried about Obama. But as soon as Trudeau got in, that was our moment to have that division, right? So yeah. now people in my neighborhood are driving around with fuck Trudeau stickers on their truck and like all this stuff. So, uh, so I, I think, I think there's an analog between Obama and Trudeau in that sense. Uh, so maybe a, a book where you can criticize somebody from the, uh, Obama from the left would also be informative to somebody who often misunderstands the criticism of Trudeau from the left. Yeah. I think that's definitely something to consider, especially because one of the things I tried doing after I got the book published was I just kind of, I got this really long Facebook comment. Uh, this guy just went off for paragraphs and paragraphs about all these bad things Obama had done. And I kind of wish I had had it when I was writing the book because it gave me a really good uh, just kind of outline of the various, what they consider scandals and things like that right. um, of the Obama years. And I talk about um, some of them. I mentioned Benghazi, um, things like that, but Okay. One of the things, if I write a second edition, I want to include like a paragraph here or there, kind of uh, more directly addressing those. Because, like for instance, the the um, I don't remember the Fast and the Furious scandal, where um, DHS or whoever was like selling guns uh, or allowing guns to be sold to these Mexican drug cartels, and then it turned out that a, a border patrol agent had gotten killed by one of these guns, and the federal oh, government yeah. lost lost track of them. I was a big fiasco and, and conservatives kind of raked Obama over the coals for this. Um, now, as it turns out, that project had begun under George W. Bush, like a lot of things that were bad <laughs> in Obama, they got started under Bush. Um, and they were obviously part of this ongoing war on drugs that goes all the way back yeah. uh, technically to Nixon, but you can see hints of it in uh, LBJ and even Kennedy right. um, with his emphasis on um uh, juvenile delinquency in the 60s, right? So this is a bipartisan project. So it's one of those things, the conservative critique of a, a particular president often has a kernel of truth. They just completely twist it in this very <laughs> partisan way. Yeah, like, true. yeah, Fast and the Furious was really stupid and Obama can definitely be criticized, but I think he can be criticized for not trying to end the war on drugs. Yeah. Rather than continue, like, and he didn't, this wasn't something that he planned. It was just bureaucratic institutional inertia. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, his, his uh, department of justice came in and was like, yeah, this is something we have to worry about. Let's not audit it. Let's not, you know, we'll just let it keep going. It's working. Um, we'll keep it. <laughs> and, well, it's doing something. Right? Yeah, it, yeah. Um. So, you know, I, if I get a second edition, I definitely want to include a paragraph about that, for instance, because I do talk about, um, you know, how Obama failed the black community, people of color and, and how, Mass incarceration didn't end under his watch, didn't even try and address it. Police brutality, same thing. Right. Um, but that's a good example uh, that crosses the fact that he didn't end the war on drugs with a, uh, it happens to be a thing that conservatives were angry about at the time. So, um, you know, looking back, that would have been something to add. But uh, there are other examples of that in the book. You know, Libya and Benghazi is a great example. You know, conservatives were very angry about that. And yeah. you can criticize Obama for getting involved in Libya and like destroying the whole country, basically, um, and then allowing the, that that precipitated the their neighbor Mali to have a revolt because all these mercenaries from Libya went home after Gaddafi was overthrown and were like, "Well, we have guns and we're kind of annoyed with the current government of Mali, which was their homeland. Right. So let's overthrow them." <laughs> um, and so it kind of it ripples out and affects multiple countries and everything. So we can definitely criticize Obama's Libya policy, but not particularly because Benghazi was some Pizzagate level <laughs> conspiracy, you know? Right, right. Um, yeah, like you say, like there's always that kernel of truth, but they blow it in this and twist it in this weird way that uh, makes it almost incomprehensible to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Exactly. Like, I'm sure you have plenty of problems with Trudeau that you could probably like, yeah, you know, your neighbor with the fuck Trudeau sticker, like, oh yeah, I agree. <laughs> but maybe for the reasons not quite that you, agree. yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's, uh, <laughs> often, uh, Canadians hate Trudeau, uh, for reasons related to cl climate change, carbon tax, uh, we, I live in Western Canada. So of course we're alienated. He doesn't build pipelines when we want him to. And he does build pipelines when, when it's, uh, when we don't want him to or whatever. Plus his dad was prime minister years and years ago. So, 
Honestly, which that's hey, bad. that's a you know what? Fair criticism. Nepotism yep. sucks, and that's a good example of how the deck is stacked against normal people. Like all, that's all true. Like cool, yep. fair enough. That's right. Um, he's too handsome for his own good. You know. Yep. <laughs> oh, hey, hey, can't stop doing blackface. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, wait, not everyone has that problem. Wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess like where, how much of say uh, a Bill Clinton or a, uh, a George Bush legacy impacted the way that uh, pre- uh, Barack Obama was president? Did he just kind of follow in the footsteps or did he try and actually change anything? So he he really tried, I think, when he got into office, he was very optimistic that he could get beyond this partisan bickering. Um, okay. And so he, he looked to the Clinton years for a model of that in the sense of uh, Clinton – after Clinton's early failures with his health care reform that went nowhere, the don't ask, don't tell controversy, things like that, um, passing NAFTA to much um, you know controversy, Clinton veered pretty hard right – um, right. Yeah, and yeah. he, it was a strategy called triangulation where he would try and take these conservative issues like criminal justice, um, or welfare reform, which is gutting welfare yeah. and make them part of the new Democrat platform. And so, uh, what you end up with is not everything, but a lot of stuff got bipartisan support. So like his, one of his early budgets prioritized balancing the budget, which is something Republicans always talk about and they never do. Um, and so Republicans didn't vote for that at all because if the Democrat does it, they don't like it. But they did vote for his crime bills and for his Wall Street deregulations um, and uh, you know, yeah. the, the 1996 Telecommunications Act that basically all this public uh, public knowledge and information that's got pumped out to the Comcast of the world and allowed uh, the, the current – you know, conglomerated media landscape we have today, that's all Bill Clinton. Yeah. So uh, it was a conservative legacy. Uh, you know, balanced budget is an inherently conservative reactionary thing, um, you know, because you always balance the budgets yep. and prioritize the military spending, right? Right. Um, so Obama looked at that as a model, like, okay, if I, if I bring these Republican ideas to the table, if I try and compromise, uh, at least to a degree, I can get enough bipartisan support to get through this logjam. And as it turned out, that was a completely optimistic false assumption. Yeah. So in some ways, um, the Bush years affected him as well because he had to deal with a lot of foreign policy stuff. And so even though he wasn't a um, energetic supporter of the war on terror, he still thought it had to be fought mm. just less stupidly. Right. So his foreign policy ended up being uh, summed up as don't do stupid shit. Um, which is a, a truism, and it's certainly <laughs> yeah. good to keep in mind. Um, but his political calculus, um, which I, I uh, basically spell out in broad terms in the book, is that by being conservative in foreign policy, he thought he could get more done domestically. Um, and that didn't work out. No, it didn't. And it's a, it's a reasonable conclusion to come to if you're Bill Clinton, right? Because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Democrats have always had that kind of chip on their shoulder about uh, they're not tough enough on the Russians or the terrorists or the Iranians or whoever it happens to be. Right. Um, you know, for the last couple of decades, Republicans have kind of had that in the bag for whatever reason. Even though on a policy level, Democrats and Republicans are very similar. the The defense buildup that we see in the Reagan years began under Jimmy Carter, right? right. Um, things like that. So. You know, Obama thought that he could reach across the aisle with some Republican ideas. We see that most obviously in Obamacare, which took bits from Mitt Romney in Massachusetts and from the Heritage Foundation with the uh, market exchange, the insurance market exchanges, um, things like that, um, not championing the public option at all. Uh, you know, when it was first introduced, it was in there. Um, and Obama was like, well, if it's in there, eh, it's fine. If it's not, I'm happy to. And of course, in the Senate, it got excised. Um, and Obama was like, that's fine. Um, and of course, even despite that, it got essentially no Republican support. Right. right? Um, and of course, we can chalk that up to a, a combination of of the partisanship that had been building since the end of the Cold War plus racism. Right. Mm-hmm. When you put those two things together, uh, you get very bad results from a, from a, you know, a Democratic perspective. So um, 
Clinton influenced Obama as far as what he thought he might be able to accomplish if he followed similar models. And Bush influenced Obama in the sense that he really um, defined Obama's foreign policy. So in his first term, he was cleaning up a lot of the messes. And in his second term, he was trying to get beyond them by um, mm. pivoting towards China, trying to extricate the U.S. from the Middle East and direct our attention towards our near peer competitor in China right. and to a lesser degree Russia. Right. Um, and so we see that evolve under Trump with the trade war with China. We see right. that evolve under Biden, um, who has issued a lot of uh, pretty combative rhetoric against authoritarianism. Right. Um, yeah. You know, specifically China and Russia. So. It's interesting to see the limitations that Obama was working under, how he tried to deal with those, and then how his policy decisions have subsequently rippled into other presidencies. Oh, that's that's really interesting. It seems like uh, in many ways you can draw like lines directly from, you know, throughout history to like, here's what led to this and here's what led to this. And here's what led. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's really interesting stuff. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, it's always history is always an oversimplified narrative of very complex right. events. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, I try and pull as many threads together as I can. Obviously, my own biases are going to influence what I emphasize versus what somebody else emphasizes, that kind of thing. But um, I, I do hope readers get uh, at least a better sense of how deep these policy decisions go back into the the eons of time, you know? Yeah. So we'll go into counter propaganda. Now for this, th it might seem a little bit obvious to everybody on the left, uh, but apparently uh, you have here that right-wingers still think Obama was a socialist. Uh, so why wasn't Obama a socialist? <laughs> sure. So obviously on the left, we're going to have all kinds of doctrinal discussions about what socialism actually is, but perhaps we can broadly define it as worker control of the means of production. Yeah. Right. So in whatever way you want to actualize that dream, the idea is that the people that produce the value also reap the benefits of that labor. Yeah. Right? So perhaps in an American context, that might be um, carried forth in extremely pro-union policies or policies that foster the development of worker co-ops or that curtail corporate power or that get corporate money out of politics these kinds of things. So even in that narrow economic sense of, uh, you know, a, kind of a limited definition of socialism, Obama doesn't meet any of those requirements. Like right. every Democrat since, uh, you know, FDR, he's had pro-worker, pro-union rhetoric. Mm -hmm. But pretty much with the exception of FDR, <laughs> every other Democrat has at least done, they've at least sat back and watched the conservatives dismantle union power. Right. And that goes all the way back to Harry Truman uh, with um, the Taft-Hartley Act, I think it was, in like 1947-48, um, which did a lot to start the, the, the process of dismantling American labor power. Um, Truman ran on a platform of, we're going to repeal that, and then did nothing to repeal it, nor did JFK, LBJ, Carter, right. Clinton, Obama, <laughs> or Biden, right? Um now, obviously, that's an old law. It's probably been superseded by other things and that kind of thing. But the the trend was there. Union mm -hmm. uh, membership has gone down and down and down in the last couple of decades. Its power has gone down. Um, but it's because the Republicans don't even pretend to like unions, right. union voters are kind of stuck with the the, Demo the Democrats are nothing, right? Um, so, but in that economic sense, Obama was very much not a socialist. His policies, like we mentioned earlier, allowed for the um, you know, accumulation of more wealth among fewer banks. Right. Um, you know, the economic "quote unquote" recovery from the Great Recession saw even more money up, as opposed to going down. Um, the the jobs that came out of the recovery were gig economy gigs. Uh, you know, part time, no benefits, uh, crappy yeah. benefits. Um, the Affordable Care Act basically assured private insurance companies would have even more access to customers because now you're legally obligated to get health insurance, right. um, that kind of thing. So there was no, uh, no attempt to have Medicaid negotiate drug prices on a national and universal level, um, that kind of thing. So uh, some of his policies were socially liberal, again, repealing don't ask, don't tell, supporting marriage equality. Um, you know, he allowed tr uh, trans people to serve in the military and, 
that might not actually be that great of a thing, but at least it's within the context of, uh, of the American project. Um, that's a small gain, I guess. Right. Um, but you know, even though he had these, some, at least some social, um, you know, reforms, you know, he commuted a lot of, uh, drug sentences by the end of his presidency, like thousands of them, which was more commutations than like the last five or six presidents, I think combined. Um, so it, it wasn't nothing, but it was, barely less than nothing because of course mm. the drug the anti-drug policies were still in effect um department of homeland security was still very powerful um you know that the dea is still very powerful all this money is going to police all across the country that kind of thing so um in in pretty much no way was he socialist and in barely any way was he um, <laughs> an unalloyed progressive right yeah yeah um, yeah but, but republicans they just don't see it that way because, uh, you know, they they saw him as an other, right? And his race helped with that. His name helped with that. The yeah. birther conspiracy and everything else really helped with that. Um, it, it makes it it made it a lot easier for Republicans to s- kind of read in what they wanted to see mm. um, in in uh, you know a Democrat. And Republicans have increasingly viewed the Democrats as just evil, like outright right. evil. You know, with the way they view Nancy Pelosi or Hillary Clinton, for instance. Um, even though I don't like either of them, most of their policies are crap. But they're not like fly attracting devils, right? Like, like an Alex <laughs> Jones might say. <laughs> right. Um, but this yeah. is the way that Republicans, since Newt Gingrich at least, have been increasingly and dominantly talking about even conservative Democrats. So you take that plus the fact that the guy's black and you have just a recipe for um, propaganda yeah. you know, disaster. So how mu- I, I mean, it's an easy go-to excuse to say like, okay, well most of this is because uh, right-wingers just don't know what socialism is. But I, I wonder, is that a reasonable <laughs> statement or is there more, more there? It's definitely part of it is the ignorance. Um, I mean, obviously, America is almost legendary for its lack of class consciousness and its uh, historical ignorance, even of its right. own stuff. I mean, like like we said at the beginning, I um, even as a history major, I didn't know a lot of this history. Um, so you know, imagine not even being interested in history. You're definitely not going to know it. So yeah. there's a lot of ignorance plays into it and a lot of um, – you know, just the kind of stuff that uh, Americans have been dealing with for centuries with, you know, playing one part of the working class off the other. Um, you know, you play the Irish off the Italians, off the Poles, you know, off the off the African-Americans, that kind of thing. So um, that plays a huge part of it. And then also the whole culture war thing. Um, mm. I think a lot of times the left uh, tries to dismiss those as kind of immaterial. And in some sense, they're right, obviously. Like the, yeah. the, the emphasis that the left usually places on material economic conditions is incredibly important. However, we do also live in brain space where <laughs> culture exists. Yeah. Um, and that is very important to people. And so you, in some sense, rhetorically have to meet people where they are, I think. Um, so as much as I might not want to talk about the goddamn Marvel Cinematic Universe for the umpteenth time <laughs> and how Thanos is or is not a representation of whatever political blah, blah, right. blah. Yeah. Um, you do kind of have to meet people where their interests are. And if, if uh, you know, conservative gamers, for instance, are not interested in talking about, um, you know, the, the black experience of the 1920s and the destruction of uh, Black Wall Street in Tulsa or whatever the case may be, maybe they'll talk about it in the context of whatever video game is popular. Or like, you know, yeah. I don't know, the new, whatever the new battlefield is or something like kind of shoehorn your way in there and discuss it there or something. But um, so the conservatives take that historical ignorance, that economic ignorance, and they combine it with um, an emphasis on these culture war issues. And I think that's how you get a real misappreciation of, uh, you know, at least what's closer to reality than what they think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess we better move on to uh, foes and comrades. Um, so for your foe, you have a lobbyist and dem operative Teal Baker. Yeah. So who who is Teal Baker? That's a good question (laughs) because I didn't know that until you asked the question, pick a foe. So I, I I thought about it and I was like, okay, I go to this website, open secrets. Uh, it's a really well-known website that lists out, um, where various politicians get their campaign contributions. Right. And so I clicked on Obama. I went to the 2008 campaign. I just started like poking around a little bit. And uh, this woman, um, T. 
Teal Baker popped up a lot. Okay. And she has a very long resume of being involved in lobbying, right? Mm. So she um, starts out with the Podesta Group, uh, which used to be a, a couple a couple years ago it folded, but for like a decade or more, it was a very large lobbying firm um, that handled insurance companies, defense contractors, like kind of across the gambit of industries, right? Right. Um, she was then the the national director of surrogates for Obama for America, so. Whatever that necessarily means, it does indicate that she was pretty heavily involved in the Obama campaign. It's like, okay, well, that might not be a great indicator of where things are going if, if yeah. they, this is the kind of industry insider that's with you. Um, <laughs> she was part of his presidential inaugural committee um, and then went back to Podesta. Then she was a consultant for the DNC for a couple of years. Like, I just thought she was a kind of a, a not very well known necessarily, but just a an emblematic instance of the kinds of people that float in and out of politics and lobbying right. that are going to affect what the politicians that we see on the news actually do say, think, and, and believe. Right? She's almost a uh, representative of the swamp the way that, uh, say, uh, Donald Trump was talking about draining, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and she's a really good example of how um, the Democrats might be extremely marginally better than the Republicans in some specific ways, but they mm. are both fundamentally capitalist political parties. Yeah. Um, and so big businesses tend to favor the Republicans, but they're happy working with the Democrats too a lot of the time because, you know, like when Obama got into office, um, this gets back to the title of the book, he was our man in Washington. Um, that's a quote from a financial executive because right. in and early in his administration, he met with half, like about maybe a dozen of them, and they were pretty trepidatious because they weren't a hundred percent sure. Like, okay, we're going to have to have some kind of reform, obviously, because people are very mad. But how far is this guy going to take it? He was only in politics a couple of years before this happened, so we don't really have a good way to gauge that. Mm -hmm. And as it turned out, Obama told them, "I'm the only thing between you and the pitchforks. I'm not here to destroy you." Um, <laughs> Obviously, like some things are going to have to change, but for the most part, uh, these guys left relatively satisfied. And one of these financial executives quoted uh, was quoted by a journalist after the meeting as saying, "This guy is our man in Washington." Oh yeah. So I thought that was a a very pregnant phrase because you can kind of read into just the phrase itself. You can read in whatever you want. Right. Oh, this book is pro Obama. It's from a dirty liberal perspective. Or wow, you know Obama, he really was our man. He was the people's champion. Like, mm, nope. This is specifically <laughs> about he was a, a a defender of the capitalist order. Just yeah. maybe with a couple of tweaks here and there. Right. 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 Um, so she is a good example of of that phenomena among the Democratic Party. Nice. All right, and for uh, your comrade. You have FDA regulator Francis Oldham Kelsey. Yeah. So um, I have had – she's been on my mind a lot recently. I was watch, listening to a Behind the Bastards episode about um, thalidomide. Oh, yeah. Which was yeah. this um, you know, sleep medicine from West Germany in the 50s. And uh, because the, the West German government didn't force the, uh, the company to test it properly and everything – ended up going on the market with very little in the way of actual scientific testing behind it as far as its side effects and its harms. And there's indications it might have been, uh, the testing might have originally been done during the Holocaust by these Nazi doctors that went to work for these pharmaceutical companies. That's not 100%, but there's hints of that. Right. The evidence, surprisingly, was probably destroyed. Um, <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> but um, so this uh, this woman, Frances uh, Autumn Kelsey, so she's a, she's a American-Canadian. Um, so she bridges our gap as well. Yes, there we go. <laughs> and she just happened to be the FDA regulator who was tasked with determining if this drug should be sold on the U.S. market. It had been all over Europe by this point. And so this German company was like pretty sure it was going to get sold in the U.S. It was a sure thing, right? Yeah. And so she looked at the evidence they provided and was like, this is crap. Like, where is your real scientific data? Where is the rigor uh, you know, these harm studies are very shallow. They don't really give anything determinate. So do more research and let me know. Right. And of course, they went above her head to her boss. And thankfully, her boss uh, was like, it doesn't matter that she's a woman. She's correct. You guys don't have good paperwork. Because of course, <laughs> these these German guys were like, oh, she's just a woman. She means nothing. And her boss was like, what are you talking about? She has a good point. So thanks as as much as is possible, thanks to this one individual, yeah, 
so many babies were saved from death or hideous disfigurement, uh, you know, women saved from all this uh, trauma and everything else. Um, Cause a couple years after this, the little mite was, was pulled from European markets. Uh, they tried selling it elsewhere, which right. is you know awful in its own way because capitalist institutions always looking for those new markets. Yeah. But um, at least the U S and I think Australia as well, those are the two big places where uh, it was not, you know, thrown at the population. So um, as much as the FDA has its own problems and federal regulation isn't the answer to everything and all that kind of stuff, um, I just thought it was helpful to keep in mind, like sometimes these people do important things. And so when, when conservatives in either of our countries talk about, you know, regulations always get in the way, that is not the case. (laughs) Very much. (laughs) Sometimes they literally save people. Yep. (laughs) Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Yeah. It seems like almost everybody uh, that I talk to listens to Behind the Bastards. <laughs> yeah, it's entertaining. It's They do a good job. Uh, it's always informative. Um, yeah, it's just a pretty solid podcast. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, I guess where are some places that people can find you online? So the, the place I am unfortunately most active is Twitter. So you can find <laughs> me. Uh, yeah, it's... Believe yeah. me, it's better than Facebook. <laughs> yes, that is 100% true. I do have a Facebook, uh, uh, you know, Owen D. D. Symes, if you want to look at me there. Um, I don't like it very much, but I do have it. Yeah. Um, Twitter, same thing. So at Owen underscore Symes, you can find me on Twitter there. Um, oh. You can find more information about the book at uh, johnhuntpublishing.com. Um, just search he was our man in Washington or search my name, Owen Symes, and it'll pop right up. Um, you can pick it up at Amazon if you really have to, Barnes and Noble. Um, but there is a link there to IndieBound where they partner with local bookstores to try and source a copy that way. So if you can avoid giving money to Jeff yeah, Bezos, much better. <laughs> recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> no, right on. So I guess just before uh, I let you go, uh, is there anything that you think I should have asked you that uh, you want to say? Um, I think I would just emphasize, even though electoral politics is kind of a wash on the federal level, I think it does matter locally. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, school board elections or the city council, like that's how you get at least some of this reform. Like, you know, Minneapolis is thinking about actually dismantling their police department and starting from scratch, right? Right. Um, That kind of stuff only happens through, through local organizing. And of course, I say this, I just moved to a new city, so I'm trying to like figure all that stuff out. Um, I'm more a cloistered, reclusive, uh, scholarly kind of person, but, um, that is something I keep meaning to do is like go to city council meetings and try and get involved that way. Um, because that stuff does matter. Uh, even though leftists are probably never going to have enough institutional power to do that much on the federal level. Um, you know, you get a half a dozen leftists together at a city council meeting and you can actually sway some people and sway some policies. Um, and that's how you get, more livable cities and, and, you know, uh, publicly funded internet and, um, you know, less anti-homeless policies and things like that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, in Regina, actually, we have a, a fairly, fairly progressive, uh, city council. And the, so far it has meant that they aren't breaking up a homeless encampment that is, uh, staying in one of the parks here. So I, I find that that's good. The, the- <laughs> And they're trying to find solutions by actually giving them housing in various ways. So, and that's coming from the city, not the province, not the country. That's our city council. So, yeah. And I think that that dovetails nicely with that whole idea of dual power and organizing locally and all that kind of thing. Um, Because as much dual power as you might be able to, to create, the city is still going to be there. And it's still going to have a government, presumably. Um, So at least these smaller institutions, I think, are a lot easier to co-opt. Yep, for sure. And I think uh, as leftists, it's probably beneficial to us to be involved in that because the right knows this also. (laughs) And and that's why you have school boards that sometimes vote against uh, LGBT uh, inclusion programs and stuff like that. So. Yep, exactly. The the Phyllis Schlafly's of the world know this very well. Yeah, that's right. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was fun. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. It's really appreciated and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects. 
If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating or a re- and a review on the podcast app of your choice or on one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser or RateMyPodcast.com would be great. If you want to find more from me, make sure to check out the show notes or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical court. You can find all my social media stuff there, as well as links to my other show, From Many People's Strength, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics, and a project I'm involved in with my friend Damien Marie at Hope that's called Atheist, Humanist, Leftist, Revolutionaries. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty, and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. You can email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. And if you want to be a guest on the show or know someone I should reach out to, then feel free to let me know. You can book interviews in my available time slots on my Calendly, which is also found in my link tree. Thanks so much for listening, and let's try to make sure we're applying critical thinking and reasoned skepticism when we're attacking the system. If we get caught up in bad thinking, we can derail ourselves. <laughs>